Corbin. Now, here's Bruce Bosner and Turp Talk. Good evening. This is Wayne Viner. Bruce is away from the microphone this evening. And with me in studio, uh, back from North Dakota, is Jordan Viner who has uh, his eye on college football at all levels. Uh, but we're going to start off, as we're waiting, uh, Bruce will be in in a moment on the phone here to talk some Orioles. But we had a really interesting day today, going out to College Park and seeing D.J. Durkin talking about the 2018 recruiting class, which some services have rated as the 17th best class in the nation. Jordan, were you impressed with the enthusiasm? And welcome in, by the way. Well, thanks for having me. Were you impressed by the enthusiasm that DJ Durkin showed for this football team? Well, after the last time I saw him, the last time a lot of people saw him, was after the Penn State game where, you know, it didn't go very well for the Terps. And then, you know, he came out with all this enthusiasm for the class, and it was really good to see him back to that pep in a step kind of way. Yeah, listening to DJ you could see why people gravitate to him and why he has been the National Recruiter of the Year, uh, why he brought in a top 17 class. I think it's somewhat miraculous to bring in a class that's ranked this high, highly coming off a season when they had four wins. Uh, talk about that for a minute. Were you afraid that the season was going to affect what happened with the recruiting? Well, you have to be. You know, when I was looking at the rankings and the teams, you know, the 18 or 19 teams above us, then there was just nobody like us who was not a traditional power or didn't have a great season last year. So it's really, really impressive that DJ and his staff were able to create such hype around the program despite their not having a good season. But I assume that these students, student athletes, who decided they wanted to go to Maryland made this selection to be a Terp based on... DJ's enthusiasm, the ability to play right now, and because they think they're going to be one of these kids that turns Maryland from what was known as a sleeping giant into somebody that can really compete. And it was really cool to hear DJ say that we are in the best conference in America, we are in the best division of any conference in America, and we expect to win this. Well, for me personally, DJ... When he brought that kind of sales pitch, his recruiting pitch at the end, when they asked how he convinces people to play here, it made me, as not so much as a fan, it just made me believe again that I've always been more of a pessimistic fan. But hearing him... <laughs> you pessimistic? Um, well... Well, hearing him sell, sell the program, it made you believe that we really could be the next Big Ten power. And I hope that we are, but we have a one powerhouse in town our baltimore orioles and had some really bad news today bruce so let's talk about some zach Britton here yeah i am very disappointing and uh you know why you know why your boy's always a pessimist because he roots for the redskins how can you not be a pessimist well the redskins won the ravens yeah, won, won but the orioles what's going on here uh you know it's funny, I talked to Stan the fan, and uh, he's thinking it might be time to offer Britain like a three-year short deal since obviously his value is diminished right away, having to miss six months, and who knows if it's not longer, and to come back, is it going to take him the rest of the year to get back in shape? It's a very, very bad day for the Orioles, very bad. Does but, the, I mean, look, they were figured on getting along without Zach Britton as it was, but at least they would have gotten something for him. And now, right this minute, you know what they're going to get for him. Nothing. Nothing, nothing. right now. Uh, More important today, tell me about uh, football, the uh, signing day. Any surprises? Well, we were just talking that I think the major surprise is there were no flips. Maryland came into this with a top 20-ish recruiting class, had a fairly poor season on the field record-wise, and unlike every other year, our top players, top prospects, weren't poached away by somebody else. He closed, of the 22 possible to close, he closed 20 of them today. Two deferred, the, the two are... Um, Noah Boinkin of Woodson High School in D.C., and 
Saladin Malachi, also out of Woodson High School in D.C., both four-star recruits. So and they deferred. Now, what's the story on the kid who's the grandson of Elgin Baylor? That interests me. Uh, I do have notes on that, so give me a second uh, to get back to that one. But the overall take is we have depth, quality depth across the offensive line, four big recruits, the defensive line, and linebackers pick up. We did get one quarterback, and probably the biggest news was a Byron Cowart, who was at one time ranked the number three recruit in the country, and he went to Alabama. Leaves Alabama, does a JUCO year, and is coming to Maryland. Uh, but Jordan has some information on Tyler Baylor. Well, he's a three-star recruit out of Olney. Played for Good Counsel, the, the local D.C. powerhouse. And it's interesting to see where he's going to fit in. He plays the buck position, which is currently occupied by Jesse Annie Bodum, but he's going to be senior next year. So there's real possibility that he could get on the field in the next couple yeah. years. Now, Jesse coming back is a story. Everybody said Jesse Annabonum, who broke his ankle at the Texas game, was gone. He talked to his people, who talked to the NFL people, and his better prospect is to stay. So he will be. Well, that's like picking up a recruit, a darn, a darn good one. Well, yeah, if you can get Jesse Annabonum to be the guy that he was when he got hurt, and you can get Byron Cowart to be the strong side defensive end, Jesse plays the stand up linebacker, uh, weak side defensive end. Boy, that, that adds a lot. It instantly adds pass rush to this team. And that's well, something Wayne, we needed. I'll give, you, I'll give you credit. You're always the optimist when it comes to Maryland football. But it's, you know what it is? It's, it's time. That's all I can say. It, it's just time. I'm not talking about going 12-0, and 0, and I'm not talking about any kind of nonsense like that. But it's time that we turn into a 7-5, 8-4, 9-3 team. And uh, I hope this class can do it, and I hope the guys from last year are ready. Uh, the defections were kind of right now were better than we thought, aren't they? Right now, it's better than we thought, but who knows? The, this isn't a two-class rebuild. This is a four-class rebuild. We are looking at the second top 20 class, and you'll know that the Terrapins have gotten someplace when you go to the bench and the 80th kid on the team – was a three, four-star recruit that DJ brought in. Right now, even if all of these young men play, that's still only 40 kids, and they're all freshmen or sophomores, the, you still it's still a year or so away. You have to get one or two more of these classes. And then you're in a competitive landscape where the entire team is at a top 20 recruit level, which is what we're up against. We did great. But we're still up against Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Michigan State, et cetera. And Jordan said that the schedule looks easier next year because we play who? We play Illinois next year, which is a long overdue one is what it feels like to me. But it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get our six or seven games. You still have to pull an upset out somewhere. So I'll try not well, be so optimistic. You, I'm going to leave you with this thought, Wayne. we got uh, a solid eight and a half months until we play Texas on September one. But let me tell you something, the national champion Maryland lacrosse team takes the field in six weeks against the Naval Academy. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. It's too far ahead to think about football, although today and it sounds like DJ would be great. But the proof is in the pudding. It's time to win. And on that note, uh, is that it for you tonight? Yeah, that's it for me today. Take it home and... Uh, you know, have a great show. I know you're going to talk some Ravens and some more Maryland basketball, so uh, take it home for me, and thanks for subbing for me today. Absolutely. That is the sports maven himself, Bruce Posner, here on Coons Ford's Terp Talk this Wednesday and every Wednesday on 1300 CBS Sports Radio, WJZ AM in Baltimore. So as Bruce makes his way away from the phone, we'll have Bill see if he can find Mason who's been following this recruiting as religiously as anybody that we have. Of course, Mason, our college football expert. So, Jordan, when you talk about a guy like Byron Cowart, and Maryland's had a couple players who were very highly regarded, big stars, like Caleb Henderson, the quarterback, really couldn't get on the field. And I remember uh, when Maryland brought in a wide receiver to go on the other side uh, with Stephon Diggs. Who was that? That was Deion Long. 
and he was supposed to be spectacular. And they, Caleb Henderson never got on the field. Dion Long did, and he had a short pro career. I guess his most famous pro moment was getting thrown off the Rams on hard knocks. But uh, we'll bring Mason in to talk a little Byron Cowart, and I'm going to start this off with saying if you can get a guy who's 6'3", 277, uh, from Sefner, Florida, he went to Armwood High School, who he was in Alabama, and he was the number three player in America. For Maryland, you got to give the guy a shot. Mason, what do you think? Well, I do like those odds of getting a player at one point ranked number three in the ESPN top 300 guys. But I looked at the film today. I looked at a lot of the stuff written by AL.com, who reports on Auburn. And I'm not sure if he's going to be as great as he was expected to be out of high school, but I definitely think he can contribute, especially on a defensive line that struggled pretty much every game last year. Well, I think something worth noting that a lot of people aren't too keen on is schematic differences in defense. Now, everybody remembers when the Redskins signed Albert Hainsworth to his $100 million contract a few years ago. One of the big reasons that he struggled so much is schematic changes, where he played an end position for the Titans and then moved to tackle for the Redskins. The same thing happened here. He was ranked a top, um, excuse me, a number three player as an end, but then Auburn, because of his size and build, moved him inside. Maryland plans to move him back outside, so I think there really is potential that he reaches his potential. Well, Jordan, I don't know if that's completely the truth, because in the film that I looked at of him playing at Auburn, he was playing end. It's just a different kind of lineup position that Maryland uses. He'll be more set to the outside. I also think that will benefit him. But he's getting pushed around, especially in the games where he got his big chances, Texas A&M, LSU. He seemed to be getting kicked back, but, you know, when looking at Maryland, they need everything that they can get on the defensive line. Okay, so maybe the guy is not the second coming of Reggie White, or Richard Dent, but he could be an upgrade from what we've been doing. I mean, last year we ended up playing freshman Bryce Brand at rush end because we didn't have anybody else. Now well, Auburn's reporting group still said he can be the next big thing. He has the body. He has the drive. It just didn't work out there. And, you know, we've seen guys transfer and become big things. He has the potential. He's just not there quite yet. Well, I think Jimmy Brumball, who's the Maryland defensive line coach, has gotten improved play. It's just that the kids, as we, Mason, you and I, walk across the field and looked at what was Maryland's defensive line and said they look like linebackers, and this is the D-line. The size just wasn't there. Even a Kingsley Opara just wasn't as big as as you would have liked. Yeah. Well, I think that size is something that really matters on defensive lines because you need to be able to push the other guys backwards. And that's something that we've talked about a lot recently is which way the line pushes. And Maryland's defensive line has been put on skates in big games. We get pushed back a couple yards, and that's all the difference in the world. Well, that's got to stop. And do you think that uh, – And I, what's our out time from this segment? All right, we're going to go into what do you think of Andy Boo and do you think they should give him as a defensive coordinator uh, another couple of years? I think you have to stick with your system. Um, if there's anything I've learned in college sports, it's that you need to stay with what you're doing. Trusting the process matters because you're recruiting for a certain scheme. And if you just switch the scheme, then you're recruiting. You have all these kids that don't necessarily fit into the new scheme and you're in a worse position than what you started with. Now, I think you let, yeah, you let him play out. You'd think as DJ, being a former defensive coordinator, knows what he's doing here with who he chose, and let his scheme play out, and if it's not working in a couple years down the line, then, yeah, you might want to make a change. Mason, you've been, um, uh, you've been with him on the road, at home, et cetera. What do you think? You know, it's an interesting look that Jordan gave us at it, but... You look at this team, there's, it's been two years now, and I'm just tired of the 63 points, the 70 points, the 56 points. I mean, I guess you've got to give it one more year. You know, it's a third year. It's always a big decision year when you're looking at a coach, and I think the way that they've recruited, he's earned the right to coach this season. But if you keep on getting these ridiculous amount of points dropped on you and your defensive lineman getting pushed back four yards against the team that – 
you're expected now to compete with. I just think if it doesn't, if it goes the same way this year, he's got to go. Well, one other thing that DJ had an emphasis on his press conference is receivers, and he's very happy with the, I think, four or five receivers we have in the new class. But without DJ Moore and him going to the NFL, which is officially confirmed yesterday, we really lack playmakers in the receiver position. And he, again, DJ, fitting Walt Bell's scheme, brought in 6'3", 6'4", big blocking-type receivers. But you start to wonder if there's anybody left to make plays. Well, you bring in Daryl Jones, a true four-star Virginia Beach. Uh, Chris Beatty, I believe, was his recruiter. You've got Jashawn Jones, who's supposed to be a spectacular go-getter as a ball skill, supposed to be off the charts. He's from Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, These are kids that other teams have been after. This isn't just Maryland, and we didn't just beat out uh, James Madison to get these kids. These are, and we had a lot of that going on under Edsel, that nobody else was truly recruiting those type of players. Not so true. Dante Demas, another three-star friendship collegiate. I think that's... uh, Azira Abdur Rahim was that coach. And then I think what's probably going to end up being the guy who's going to get on the field, Brian Cobbs. He's a three star. He's one of the best players in Virginia. Hayfield High School out of Alexandria. Extremely smooth, great ball skills, first class person, every positive. You're going to see these kids on that field next year, along with Taj Capehart, who played a little bit this year. And it's going to be a different look. And yeah, we're going to have six, three, six, four receivers who can move. It worked pretty well with DJ Moore. Hopefully they can find the next DJ if there is well, one. Well, you're going to have to incorporate some of these guys because as Jordan loves to drive home, Maryland, other than DJ Moore, had little to none, no production from other receivers. So these are four or five the guys, depending on what it goes on, with that tight end from Georgia later in February, have got to make up for some of that production. I know that you're going to have a better quarterback this coming year, but when you look at it, what would you have to say? 85 to 90% of receiver production is gone? Yeah, 85 to 90% of the production is gone. They're going to have to do something else. But I think if you have a decent quarterback, part of this was, do you give Walt Bell like five stars and a gold watch because he took Max Bortenschlager and won two Big Ten games with this kid starting? Or do, do you go the other way and say they've had Max, they recruited him, they wanted him, He's not the smoothest quarterback in the world, and this offense doesn't work. Which one is actually closer to the truth? Because they looked pretty good before the quarterbacks got hurt. Mason, what do you think? Well, they looked pretty good when they were winning, too. I mean, there were times where they seemed to have some rhythm and some smoothness to them in both of the games that they won. And other times you have to question some of the play calls. I'm yeah. concerned that they have two guys who, on the pro football stats or PFF, whatever that stands for, the guys who grade positions other than receivers and quarterbacks, that both Damian Prince and Derwin Gray graded out as some of the best linemen in the Big Ten, yet when Maryland needed to get one yard, they were nowhere to be found. Maryland couldn't get a yard when they needed it. That concerns me. If you're going to play Big Ten football, and you're certainly staying in the Big Ten, Sooner or later, we got to be able to get a yard, and when it comes down to a third and one, you have to have a better than even chance that you can stop the other team. So, Well, you're looking at two linemen in that scenario. There are five guys up there, and offensive line plays about all five of them. Now, Sean Christie, Brendan Moore, and Terrence Davis might need some work, and that's where you got guys like Jalen Duncan and Evan Gregory coming in in this class. you got to look at that as... Those five guys as a group couldn't get a yard. You might have two great ones or one great one, but all five of them have to work to get every yard. Okay, we're up against the clock, so I want to go to one player, and we're going to have Mason come back in the third segment and talk a little bit more about this, then we'll switch over to basketball. And, of course, we have Dennis from Coons Ford coming on any moment. But, Mason, talk about T.J. Bradley, who's an offensive lineman who's uh, transferring in from Lackawanna Community College out of Pennsylvania. Well, this is a guy that a few days ago, Maryland was afraid he was going to flip after the loss of offensive line coach Tyler Bowen. I like it a lot. Great size, great weight for what Maryland needs right now. He really hadn't played football since high school, and then when he got into community college, 
they took one look at him and said, we want you on our team. And he said, sure, I'll give it a shot. And it landed him a spot at Maryland. I think he has great upside for next year. I don't really see it this year, just not really playing football very often. Maryland's going to need to do some work on him. But the size and the weight is at the right spot at the right time when Maryland could use it, just another guy on the offensive line. We we're talking about a T.J. Bradley who's 6'7", 285, and Maryland was, Carolina was hot on this kid late, but earlier Penn State, West Virginia, Minnesota wanted him. He plays for former Terrapin defensive lineman Mark Duda uh, up in Pennsylvania. We've gotten a few transfers there. So that's looking good. One other thing we have to talk about on the other side of this break that's coming up is how the new tax bill that uh, apparently is going to be signed into law here any moment, how that affects college football, uh, pro football, what it does for tickets, and what it does for donations. So we'll talk about that a little bit with Dennis and Mason on the other side of this break. You are listening to Coons Ford Presents Turp Talk this Wednesday and every Wednesday. I'm Wayne Viner. Bruce is away from the microphone, joined tonight by Mason the Intern and Jordan Viner. We will be back in a moment. Welcome back to Coons Ford Turp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. Well, Bruce is away from the microphone this evening. This is Wayne Viner in with Jordan Viner joining us uh from North Dakota, where he's been seeing some championship-level football. Uh, so your NDSU Bison are going to the national championship. They have won every playoff game by 30 points or more, and it's great to see them back in it after not making it last year. Not making the championship. They were in the playoffs. Oh, of course they were in the playoffs, but they didn't make right. it to Frisco. But this year they get a chance at revenge against James Madison. And that'll be James Madison, NDSU is... January 6th for the national championship for the football championship subdivision. So uh, somebody else on the way to the playoffs, hopefully, is the Baltimore Ravens. Dennis, we still on yeah. track for this? Well, I think Dennis is there. He might have just fallen off. Oh, there we go. So after somehow finding a way to trail the Cleveland Browns for a minute, the Ravens did wake up and win that game in front of at least 5,000 interested fans. It wasn't a big crowd in Cleveland. It was a friend and family day in Cleveland, and you're right, a dismal crowd. But, look, they're still trying to win their NFL team. And, uh, look, they hung in there for a half, and once the Ravens put the uh, defense on them, they shot down like they thought they would. Yeah, it's uh, certainly a fairly, what you'd say, a fairly clear path to the playoffs, but it's always a challenge to win these games. They all seem like trap games. You play in teams that have nothing to play for. Well, they do. The nice thing is they're they're playing against basically two lame duck duck coaches and Chuck Pagano and Marvin Lewis. Lewis, of course, has already announced he won't be back, and uh, we'll all be shocked if Chuck Pagano is still employed by the Indianapolis Colts at the end of the season. Uh, it bodes well for them. Two home games. They should hold serve and get in the playoffs with some momentum. They just have to figure out the vertical game if they're going to have a shot to advance. Figure out the vertical game. This has been yep. a recurring topic, but uh, they haven't figured out a vertical game for a, a while. Is it? Is it Marty? Is it Joe? You mentioned before that sometimes he just doesn't seem to want to hang in there to the last second and take that hit, but he's had some Fairly, fairly average, slightly above average outings, but it's it's not the Joe Flacco from before. You no, know, you got to get him some weapons in the off season. The uh, team would be wise to invest in some offensive linemen uh, via free agency in the draft, and also some wide receivers that can catch and get separation and things of that sort that Joe Flacco lacks. So before we we close the the book on Joe Flacco, let's give him some weapons and see what happens. I mean, Eli Manning. Who to me is uh, Joe Flacco 2.0, right? Vice versa. He's always had weapons. Let's get Joe Flacco some young weapons that he can actually use and see what happens. Well, I think that a reoccurring question also is the Ravens have played one of the easiest schedules in the NFL, and a real question is how good are they, and can they make it deep into the playoffs if they get there? Yeah, if they have enough defense and special teams. The question is, can the offense win a game for them? And I don't think so. This is not the type of offense that can come back. Once this team gets the lead, they can they can let the dogs loose, let the linebackers and linemen and, and uh, blitz the other team to death. But once they fall behind by seven or ten points, it's pretty much over and done with. They, they just don't have the capacity 
to catch up. But they do have enough defense to scare people out there. What do you think the crowds are going to be like? Just say if it's an average weather day. I mean, if the weather's horrible, I understand at this time of the year. Do you think they can fill the place up? I think there'll be about 15,000 fans late because I, I think they've lost a good portion of the, the old diehard, the old faithful fans. That, that they're not going to get them back. The best thing they can hope for is to attract the newer generation to the stadium uh, via any means necessary. But I think they've lost. That's just not uh, you know something in symptomatic in Baltimore. I think it's the same thing across uh, all NFL cities. Uh, we saw when Baltimore went to play Pittsburgh, 15,000 empty seats up there as well for a game of that magnitude. I just don't see it happening. Uh, they also, the Ravens in particular, they have to have some star power. They don't have a Ray Lewis, Ed Reed, people we can really get behind and cheer for at the stadium. So they have to draft the, or bring in a high caliber free agent that can get the city uh, jacked up. Uh, and also winning, if they could just get back to winning ways, maybe get a home playoff game down the road, that'll, do, that'll go a long way in getting the fans back to the stadium again. But Jordan, I think it's changed. I hope the dynamic has changed. Jordan, you're a good 20, 30 years younger than anybody else in here. So you have a different perspective on this, but I've heard that your generation doesn't like to join things, isn't the type of people that's going to buy a season ticket. Or Do you think that's true? Are you an outlier? I think I am. It's not. I don't know if it's really about season tickets or anything like that. I think football is in trouble. And I think even when I, as a long time or entire life football fan, when I watch the games, just the way that in the climate I was brought up in, the first thing I often think about is, oh my god, that looked like another concussion hit. It's not yeah. It's not always a pleasant experience. And I think if you're not super into it, it's hard to watch with that mentality. Well, Dennis, I don't want to get too personal, but you you know a lot about concussions. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, you know, at some point uh, you gotta, you gotta it, it, see if what it is. So it's a barbaric sport, it's a collision sport, but then again, so is hockey, boxing, there's a lot of those uh, you know mixed martial arts and you got to make a decision, I think, as a society, you know, what you're going to cheer for. But as long as the people are willing to pay for it and see it and see a blood sport, you're going to have sports of this type. And you well, when we saw the, the Steelers against the Bengals on the, on the Monday night, that was that was old school 1980s football, 1970s football. And, uh, you know, the, the old time made me enjoyed it, but the, you know, knowing what I know and having personal experience, but I cringed. But, um, Look, head in, the head is not something to, to, to mess with, you know, whether it's hitting a soccer ball with your head. Uh, so a lot of discussion. I think it's a good thing that the younger people are looking at it and they're making wiser choices in terms of what sports they want to pursue. It's true. That, that is true. So uh, we went out uh, on 5 or $6 tickets to see the Redskins and the Arizona Cardinals the other day. And I know wow. some of the guys from the – Washington Post, I was going back and forth on Twitter, took some pictures and posted them up. I then found out that those pictures and comments made national news. They were both on Drudge and on Breitbart showing FedEx Field, what I figured was 50,000 out of 75,000 or so. There was an NFL photographer on the field that swore the lower deck was sold out, which it just wasn't. And for a couple of six-win teams... It's probably about the right crowd size, but I remember when, and I'm sure you remember whether, you know, when the Colts were at the end, uh, right before they left, yeah, they had trouble filling the place. But for the most part, yeah. the Redskins, and the Colts sold most of the tickets to every game, whether they were good or bad. Or am I misremembering here? Yeah, you're misremembering. But back in like 1981, 82, 83, I was one of 25,000 season ticket holders, and that's all you got for a home game, unless you were playing Pittsburgh. Then, of course, they brought in 35,000 fans, and the place was sold out. That's the only time we sold out the stadium. Uh, the good news is you, you can get a great seat anywhere. Once you got in there, you get the chance to see Dan Marino and Earl Campbell and all those great stars of the of yesteryear. But uh, the crowds were very dismal. That 25,000 diehards at the very end. Well, I'm going to have to agree with that. Just as a younger fan, I always felt like the narrative that it always used to be sold out, and now it's empty. I just think that's what it is. It's a narrative that fits. You know, now yeah. with the national anthem stuff and the concussions and people aren't, don't want to go to stuff anymore, it just fits well that you know, now there's you know six up fairly empty stadiums of t 16 games. I just think it fits better. I don't think it ever actually was the case that every single game was always had every single seat sold. No, not towards the end because the – the uh, Baltimore Colts, uh, Bob Ursay on Colts, that was a very hard product. 
he would never sign the star, the star players. He was very apathetic. He just didn't care. All he cared was about the dollars, and he was always threatening to move the team. And that got very, very old. It was very hard, a very hard, difficult energy to get behind and to support. So it was pretty predictable what happened with him moving the team out. Yep, it was. That's one of the reasons there's a team in Jacksonville now, because Ursay went from city to city, uh, sure. sort of trying to give the team away. But that that's enough uh, revisionist history. Let's talk about what's going on right now at Coons Ford on Security sure. Boulevard. Uh, you're running some fantastic specials, a 0% for 72 months plus cash back on cars like Fusions. I, I guess you're super busy right now. Very, very busy, Wayne. They're clearing out the decks from all the 2017s. We have zero for 72, plus cash back, as you mentioned. There's never been a better time to buy a vehicle than right now. We have about 500 of those vehicles in stock, and they're flying fast up, up the shelf. People from all over the country are flying in, taking advantage of the huge savings that we offer to Baltimore Ford. Well, you've got the deals, and I mean that that's darn close to unbeatable, and these aren't on uh, like super high priced cars. I've seen other dealers put a very expensive vehicle on sale for that. You're talking about cars that a, a regular person can afford. Anything from an yeah, explorer to a fusion to an escape. Is that true? Yeah. That is true. And the average discount's right at that twenty five percent off of MSRP across the uh, the, the model line. So that's pretty, that's a pretty significant uh, discount no matter what you're looking at. That's true. And uh, for anybody who needs repairs or anything to make a holiday trip, what's it like in the service department right now? Uh, we're a one-stop shop, Wayne, 47 service bays, full three-bay body shop, huge parts department. One-stop shop, we take care of everything, no equipment necessary, 7 to 7 every single day. All right. If you need a car, you need to get your car fixed, call Dennis. You can reach the sales department over at Coons Ford of Baltimore, 410-298-3800. Dennis, thanks for being on, and thank you so much for your sponsorship. You're there every year for us at Turp Talk and on the Sports Maven. Thanks, and have a great holiday. My pleasure. Go Ravens, go Terps. All righty. Uh, well, Jordan, Dennis knows, uh, you know, the, we're going to start talking draft with Dennis any minute. I didn't want to get into who do you think they should pick and what free agents do you want because you still have the bowl season and, and the NFL isn't quite finished yet. But it's going to be an interesting year. I've heard from some of the sports writers today in College Park that probably up to nine coaches might be let go in the NFL, and I take it that some of these college coaches might take the leap up. Um, do you have any insight on that one? Um, well, I think there's a couple candidates that really stand out as far as um, jumping to college to pros. One of them is James Franklin, who I've always thought was going to be a pro guy. He seems like that type of guy. And I, I think that if, the, if Penn State thinks he wants out, he's going to want out. Uh, he might want out. That's a, a name that's come up. I've talked to some other people that, that think Coach Frank might jump there. That happened with Bill O'Brien. He left to become the coach of the Texans. But that is a a powerhouse. You you wonder if the pressure where you're expected to win every game, and I know Penn State was expected to win every game, might get you after a while. At least in the NFL, you can lose four or five games. It doesn't do you in. Yeah, I think that at Penn State, even as me being not great, you know, not really a Penn State fan. You, <laughs> really? You expect, I kind of expected them to win a, at least 11 games. I could excuse Ohio State or Michigan like a slip up here or there. But 10 and 2 was honestly a disappointment for them. It's hard to be undefeated all the time. I'm sure Nick Saban and some of those guys and Urban Meyer uh, have similar feelings. It's hard to win every game. And with that, We'll be back. We'll have intern Mason in the house talking more about Maryland football, a little bit about basketball, and then his greatest moments of 2017. We will be back here on Turp Talk. This is Wayne Viner and for Bruce Posner along with Jordan. Thank you, Bill. We'll go to break right now. Well, Bruce is away from the microphone this evening, and we have an earlier than normal uh, departure from there tonight because Towson is taking on the Oakland, Michigan Bears. It's 11 wins for Towson so far? Yeah, I think so. They, uh, they have gotten a lot of hype for being Towson basketball. This is Wayne Viner. That is Jordan Viner. And on the phone, I believe we have uh, the famed Mason, the intern. Uh, you Bill, you want to bring him in? Yeah. All right, Mason. Guess we don't yeah. have any. Do we have some Mason there? Yes, you do. All right. 
So I want to get into a topic that we, we teased earlier, we want to talk about, is a change in the tax code that seems to negatively affect college sports. Jordan, go ahead and give it a spin. You started to write a story about that. It'll be on TripTalk.com later tonight. So the basic concept that makes it so damaging to college sports is if you are going to donate to the Terrapin Club, let's say you donate $10,000. Because it's tax deductible, it really doesn't even cost that much to give to the club because you're getting away from the taxes. But because you get standing for it, so because there's a whole PDF on the website that you can look at with all the stuff you get for a certain amount of money, but to simplify it, because you get better tickets or reduced ticket prices because you're a member of the club, you now get something in return, which kind of makes sense if you really think about it. So that's not considered a donation anymore. So, in 2018, that will no longer be a donation. So your gift to the booster club, whether it's a Terrapin club, uh, IPTE, which is Clemson's club, or any of those, not tax deductible. So if you gave this money and got, let's say, a 40% tax bump because of it, which was Jordan was alluding to, it really only cost you $6,000, to give this to your business, now you have to take the money as income, which means it's taxable. So now that ten thousand dollars, full load of tax on it, maybe it costs you fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars, and you can't get anything for it. So these college booster clubs are really going to be up against it. In addition to that, the entertainment expense deduction for businesses has changed, and this is tax talk here on Trip Talk tonight. But the Business deduction for entertainment no longer allowed. So these tickets, you can't write them off anymore. They sold a lot of tickets at Comcast Xfinity Center, M&T Bank Stadium, et cetera, FedEx Field, and what used to be uh, Verizon Center. These businesses bought the tickets, got a huge tax break for doing it. You can't write them off anymore. So I think you're going to see a huge dip in sales because the effective price to the business owner now includes their tax rate. And if you can't get a business break for it, maybe you don't buy those tickets. Mason, you think it's going to have a, a big effect? Yeah, I really do. I really, I mean, how much upside without the tax breaks is there to having a suite that costs, I don't even know how much these cost, at the NFL and it's the Capital One Arena especially because, I mean, we walked around in there. They're all businesses. There aren't many people buying personal suites that give you 18 or so tickets to pro sporting events. It's all businesses. I really don't see them buying these big luxury boxes anymore. Well, that's, this isn't necessarily set in stone yet. There could be some pushback maybe after this season, but... It, oh, it's I mean, it's in the law. Now, they might amend it next year, but for 2018, it's in there. Now, they had considered that even taking a customer out to a restaurant was not going to be deductible. It's back in this bill at 50%. So if you spend a dollar at a restaurant with a customer, you can write off 50%. That's better than nothing. I think if they would have thrown that in, it would have put almost every Morton's and Ruth's Chris out of business because people are writing this off. I think it's going to have a huge effect. The number one effect that I'm worried about, because I'm a Maryland fan, is that people aren't going to give the Terrapin Club, and they're going to have to rework the way that they give you, as Jordan said, benefits, what you get for giving money. They'll still take your donation. And if it's just a straight-out donation, you want to help pay the scholarship bill and you get nothing for it, that's still tax-deductible. But the minute you get anything for it, it's not tax-deductible anymore. You know, I just realized this actually sounds a lot like the NCAA. The minute you get something back for it, it's illegal now. Well, if the NCAA was as strict as their enforcement as the IRS was, college sports would be a lot cleaner. But anyhow, it troubles me. I talked to the uh, some of the board people for the Terrapin Club. I've spoken to other sports writers, and th this is going to be a huge impact on both pro sports, concert tickets, the current tax law is 80% deductible if you get a benefit for it. And now it's going to be 0%. So that, that's a big change. All right, let's get back to what actually happened today in College Park, which is the next signing class came in. It's a good class. Maryland got one more, uh, say, odd player, which is a kicker, Joseph Petrino. What, what's his specialty? His specialty is one of the more unique ones I've ever seen. He can kick 
field goals with both legs from 40 yards plus. And that's just, that's something I've never seen before. Never mind unique. I mean, I don't think he's, it's very unlikely he'll actually use both legs because he's stronger with his right than his left. But the ability to do that is just very, very unique. And with that, I'm going to say overall, Mason, you've been a Maryland fan your entire life. What year does it have to be for DJ to actually turn this into a winning program? Is, is next year the deadline, or does he get one more? Well, it depends on what, what, what's a winning program. Uh, for Maryland, seven wins in a bowl. I uh, think it's in two years. I think he can slide away with a five-win season next year, possibly a four-win season. But with recruiting classes like this, it's really hard to tell a guy to walk out the door. I mean, we haven't seen this at Maryland ever. Back to back twenty five top twenty five classes. Since they started ranking the classes like this, that is true. So I'm I'm encouraged. Uh, Jordan was very encouraged, you know, uh, talking to Bruce earlier in the show, tones it down a little bit because I always get really encouraged over the winter and then football season starts. But I will go now let's go to the best moments. We have a, a few minutes left here. Best moments of 2017 uh the easiest one for me is that trip to texas that that was an all-time classic i know the season didn't go well after that but beating texas at texas felt like we turned the corner didn't it jordan that felt like we should have gotten going from that moment those two weeks from texas and towson it was kind of as close as football euphoria as we got it felt like we were getting somewhere. It felt like our program was developing into a Big Ten school. And, you know, the wheels kind of fell off the bus after that. But for me personally, I think one of the best moments that I had was the NDSU game versus South, not South Dakota, um, well, Wofford that I went to, where it felt like if, if after that game we were almost sure we were going to make it to the um, championship and we had and that was a really fun energetic game for me to go to well, NDSU football is great I'm holding back the number one moment to go back to Mason what did it feel like to be on the field when Maryland won the national championship in lacrosse men's lacrosse well it felt great and honestly devastation compared to joy that North Carolina game was probably one of the worst moments in the past two years but when the Terps beat Ohio State there was just nothing like it that was the first time. I, we were on the field when the women won, and the women win national championships in several sports. That is the first men's sport that I was on the field when we won the national championship. And, and just because of that, and because of the importance that lacrosse has taken on in our lives, being Maryland fans, that was... Uh, and then we got to go to the Tawaratan Awards, and Maryland won both of those. And it's a lacrosse season that it was never done before. This was has never been done before. Maryland won the Big Ten. They won the NCAA. They had the Player of the Year, the lacrosse version of the Heisman Trophy, and they won it both for the men and the women in the same year. Uh, it was a miracle year. I'm going to add one more on that was not quite at that level, but Mello beating Michigan State, which was basically his last home game, a pretty big moment. I think that was really cool, but it wasn't to me, the of course, the national championship was number one, the Texas number two. I know that uh, non-rev Todd is out there somewhere uh, going through other moments in Maryland sports and some of the ones we don't watch. But, uh, Jordan, you have anything to add for for that being the top three? I'm go, I'll go for the top three right there. Well, I don't know. I'd have to really think about my third one. It was kind of a down sports year for me. I think um, – Seeing John Wall hit the buzzer beater against the Celtics was really cool for me. I don't think it qualifies as top three. Um, as far as Terp moments go, I think going to the Big Ten Championship, not Championship, excuse me, the tournament at Verizon Center, now Capital One Center, was really cool to go see all the fans from different schools there. I know we didn't win a single game, but it was still a really cool all-day event for me to have. Yeah, well, we won the first half. It's true. We won yeah. the first half. Right. So that, that was something. Mason, you have any personal recollections of great uh, Terrapin moments? I think you guys got that one covered. You know, initially I was going to say the, the little buzzer beater against Michigan State. I mean, there were some good moments this year, definitely. 
looking forward to some more in 2018. Well, we certainly are. I mean, basketball picks back up. Mark Turgeon, uh, we got about a minute and a half here. Mark Turgeon made a comment the other day. Jordan was uh, watching everything last night. He said that he said the basketball team right now is not playing up to its potential. Um, yep, and that's basically hits the nail on the head. I really want to scream at the radio, well, that's your job to make him go to your potential. But it's good that he recognizes that and good that he's pushing them to succeed more, and hopefully it works. He did mention them practicing better recently. What do you make of this uh, the, the new power forward, Tomajic? I really like him. Even before the season, when I was looking at who our roster, I really thought he'd get in there. But he hasn't. But Turgeon said he should be getting in more, and I really hope he does because I think there's a high ceiling there. Uh, Mason, you go to almost every home game at least. What's your take, a mini take, as we turn towards the Big Ten season of basketball? Uh, the scheduling definitely has an effect on me. I just – it becomes to a certain point repetitive when you see um, Philly yep. Dickinson. It does. It does. And Catholic on and the And in January, the Big Ten starts Penn State with their first home game on January 2nd. You have been listening to Coons Ford presents Turf Talk this Wednesday and every Wednesday here on 1300 CBS Sports Radio. Bruce is away. This is Wayne Viner with Mason Viner and Jordan Viner. Good evening and go Towson Tigers.